Good morning. Thank you, Ed, for that very kind uh, introduction. I feel like I was meeting with, uh, I, your, I see your twin, actually your son here, Steve Labaton, and I got to know Steve, Ed's son, when Steve was uh, at the New York Times, a terrific reporter, and he would always keep us on our heels uh, um, uh, when we were at the Treasury Department, and, and then subsequently through the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation, and uh, when I initially got to the CFTC, he's now working for a small bank in New York that I once worked for. <laughs> And I'm probably not allowed to say anything more on that. Um, but I want to thank the George Washington um, Law School, the Center for Law, the Economics and uh, uh, Finance, also the Business School, and the other uh, people that put this uh, all together uh, today, and inviting me to uh, speak here today. The 2008 financial crisis uh, left us with many lessons, many challenges to tackle. Ed mentioned uh, uh, some of these, of course. Uh, but as the head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, as Ed mentioned, um, uh, I swim in the derivatives lane. It, it may be a deep lane, but it's one lane in this thing. And uh, last July, uh, Congress passed the historic uh, Dodd-Frank uh, legislation. You'll hear from Senator uh, Dodd later today. Um, and uh, that, that, for the first time, brought unregulated uh, over-the-counter derivatives markets under comprehensive regulation. These derivatives, also known as swaps, uh, were not the only cause of the crisis, uh, but they certainly played a significant role in the crisis. Um, markets work best when they're transparent, open, and competitive. The American public's benefited from those attributes in the futures markets transparent, open, and competitive, and in the securities markets, and, and the great regulatory reforms of the 1930s after another great financial crisis. Um, but in enacting reforms after this generation's financial crisis, Congress directed the CFTC and the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, to bring the similar features of transparency, openness, and competitiveness to the swaps markets. And that's what we're in the midst of right now in the rule writing at the CFTC, is to really carry upon Congress's intent uh, to do just that. Let, let me just mention a little bit about the history of derivatives, if I might, briefly. But uh, derivatives are contracts used by a lot of parties, corporations, municipalities, nonprofits, others, basically to protect themselves against the risk of some uh, change in the future of a market price or input. Um, every consumer, though, is touched by uh, corporations and hedgers or even speculators' use of these derivatives. Um, some of the corporations hedge an interest rate risk. Uh, some purchase a project, uh, product from overseas and, and want to hedge a currency risk. Uh, if you flew over the holiday period, you probably uh, uh, were somehow in the price of your, your airline ticket was that that airline was hedging the jet fuel cost um, so that they can, you, you had an assured price and they had an assured, uh, hopefully, profit margin uh, at least to protect themselves on the jet fuel uh, cost and local fuel companies, of course, use derivatives to lock in the price for winter heating oil and, and the like. Um, many derivatives are called futures. Um, these are regulated by the CFTC and have been since the great reforms of the 1930s. But futures are not new. They're, they're standardized liquid derivative contracts. They've traded on exchanges all the way back to the 1860s. And they're used to hedge uh, uh, the similar risk to what I just went through. Um, but initially, they were to hedge risk in the grain markets. Uh, they were to hedge risk in corn and wheat and soy. Uh, they allowed farmers, for example, to hedge the future price risk and get the benefit of a transparent pricing market, where, where instead of just taking the price of somebody's uh, at the grain elevator, you, you could get the price in, in the central market. In those days, it was in Chicago, because the Great Lakes was a great shipping uh, and distribution point. Um, and your, one of your sponsors, I saw, was even the Chicago uh, Mercantile Exchange. Um, 
futures markets, as I said, were regulated back actually initially in the 20s and then after the great crisis in the, in the 30s. Um, but over the next 60 years, futures trading expanded to cover energy products, financial products, and Congress ensured that all of these products, without exception, had to be traded on exchanges, have transparency, openness, and competitiveness. And this allowed uh, for the great benefits that these features bring the American businesses and the ultimate consumers. Well, things sort of started to change in 1981, and that's when the swaps market place uh, started to develop. The first derivatives transactions took place off exchange. That's why it's called over the counter, um, not with the benefits of a centralized exchange. Uh, contracts were negotiated between a dealer and a corporation seeking to hedge a risk. The first was a currency risk. Uh, then the interest rate risk started very quickly after that. And in the last three decades, the over-the-counter derivatives marketplace has grown, as we know. In the 1980s, it was, a, for a while, less than a trillion dollars. Even though that's a big number, it was less than a trillion dollars. Here in the U.S. today, while there are various estimates, it's currently around $300 trillion. And to put that in, in, in a sort of scale, that's $20 of swaps for every dollar of goods and services in our economy. I mean, just to give you a sense of that, that scale, every corporation uh, has an opportunity to hedge your risk. Every product you buy in the marketplace may, in the supply chain, have somebody hedging a risk, interest, currency, oil, corn, wheat behind it through a swap or a future. The contracts uh, have become much more standardized over those 30 years, and rapid advances in technology, particularly in the last 10 years, have facilitated efficient trading of, of these products. Um, uh, but while so much of the marketplace has changed, uh, one thing remains uh, over those 30 years, was that it was an unregulated market, and also that it's dominated by a small number of dealers uh, who are pricing and transacting the marketplace, uh, but not in a centralized marketplace, not in a transparent, open, competitive uh, marketplace uh, and that brings such great benefits to the public. So when a corporation or another end user wants to hedge a risk through derivatives, they typically go to a bank and get a price. Uh, and those banks do compete with each other, but it's in this over-the-counter uh, world. When they enter into the transactions, they don't have the benefit of centralized pricing uh, that comes on an exchange. Um, the price or the quote they receive is not discovered in that transparent uh, central market. And corporations and hedgers are largely unaware of the last transaction, whether it was seconds before or minutes before or a day before that that dealer did with, with somebody else in a look-alike contract. Well, the Dodd-Frank Act includes essential reforms to address this, to bring sunshine to what has otherwise been an opaque swaps market. Uh, economists and policymakers have for decades recognized that markets uh, work best with transparency and the public benefits from transparency. The more transparent a marketplace is, the more liquid it is um, for the standardized instruments in the market. And the more competitive it is as well, which lowers costs for hedgers, borrowers, and ultimately all of their customers who stand behind those companies. Um, now, there's two types of transparency that Congress generally uh, addresses itself, uh, and they did so with the swaps marketplace, too. The first transparency is to regulators, uh, which will include, in this circumstance, that all these swaps have to be reported into data repositories and also to the regulators uh, so that there can be an effective cop on the beat. Um, but the other type of transparency is the, to the public, and that's what I want to just talk a little bit about today. Um, bringing public transparency is contrasted to the regulatory transparency. To the swaps marketplace shifts some of the information advantage from the derivative dealers to the broader market. Um, uh, now, there's great economic advantage to that when you flatten the marketplace and everybody gets information rather than it being centralized to a few number of dealers. Um, but this uh, not only benefits all the end users of these products, but also increases competition in the marketplace by lowering the barriers to entry, because one barrier to entry is information barriers. And so transparency lowers a, a critical barrier to entry 
in, in the marketplace and uh, affords additional market makers and liquidity within the marketplace. The greater number of market, placer, market makers also lowers risk to the system as a whole because when you have greater number of market makers, you have more possibility of liquidity. If one fails, there are others there who can stand in and bear risk. Um, there are three phases of a swap contract, if I might. Uh, this is not controversial, but uh, <laughs> one is before you actually enter into the transaction. Let's call that pre-trade. The second is right after the transaction occurs is reporting information right afterwards. Most people call that post-trade. And then the third phase is during the life of the contract. These contracts can exist for 30, sometimes up to 50 years afterwards. The Dodd-Frank Act addressed all three of those phases, and I think in a very thoughtful way. Um, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, let me walk you through each, each of the areas uh, in that. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with exchanges, uh, the trade securities and futures. Uh, this is where investors and hedgers and speculators can meet in a transparent, open, and competitive central marketplace. Well, what did Dodd-Frank say in this regard? It says that um, just as in the futures exchanges have to meet in a central marketplace, it's you also have to do that in swaps. So the futures exchanges can now offer swaps, but there's also a new category called swap execution facilities uh, to offer them as well. And these exchanges, the traditional futures exchanges, and the swap execution facilities will provide the marketplace with pre-trade transparency. In fact, the Dodd-Frank Act requires that the standardized swaps, other than for large block trades, uh, have to trade on these venues. And exchanges and SEPs allow buyers and sellers to meet in an open, centralized marketplace. And the CFTC has proposed rules which pr provide flexibility for market participants. They'll have the flexibility to leave firm bids and offers. If they want to communicate with the rest of the market, the rest of the market can, they, they, don't, know, they don't need an invitation into the market. They can leave a firm bid. If somebody wants to do a request for quote, meaning requesting somebody's quote, that would be allowed. If somebody wants to leave indicative quotes, which are not uh, executable, that would be allowed as well. All embedded in Dodd-Frank, but we've proposed a rule to effectuate that. The second phase, right after the transaction, which many people call real-time reporting or post-trade transparency, uh, Congress addressed that as well and was very specific that market participants and end users should benefit from this real-time reporting. And Congress said uh, a lot on this, actually. They said that uh, this transparency must be, quote, as soon as technologically practicable. Now, in 2011, that's pretty fast. Um, and we all know about Twitter. <laughs> but in, the te in, in, uh, in uh, finance, uh, some of this stuff goes on in, in less than a second. Um, so as soon as technologically practicable, Congress said that uh, uh, um, the prices should be out there. And they said that not only for the standardized swaps that might be on these execution platforms, they also said it for all of the bilateral swaps, all of the customized swaps and so forth. Now they did say that we should consider some time delays for the blocks, the very large trades, and uh, um, we have to protect confidentiality of the actors and so forth. Uh, so we've proposed a rule on that, and we appreciate anybody in the public's comments on those proposed rules. The, uh, the, the third area is then uh, a longer period of time, a long period of time that th these transactions might be out there. And let me just say some of the things that Congress said uh, uh, with regard to that, in addition to this pre-trade and post-trade period. Um, and uh, let me turn to one of the key chapters of the 2008 financial crisis to highlight why this is so important. When the large players like AIG uh, uh, were coming into some trouble in 2007, in fact, you may have read some of the books and seen, they got into what was called valuation disputes between AIG and other actors in the market. How did you value these transactions that may have been entered into a year before or three years before, but what was their valuation now? And um, the Dodd-Frank Act actually very directly 
addresses the issues about valuation disputes over the life of the swap. And it's not an inconsequential point. There's a very important point to lower risk to the system. What Dodd-Frank says is that for cleared swaps, those that could be actually brought to a clearinghouse, the clearinghouses themselves have to publicly say where they are marking their positions every single day. They have to post the settlement prices for those contracts, and everybody gets to see it, the whole marketplace, the public, the media, everybody. For uncleared swaps, which is more like that AIG circumstance, for uncleared swaps, the swap dealers have an affirmative obligation to provide mid-market pricing. That's before their profit or anything. That's the mid-market pricing to each of their counterparties every single day as well. So Congress addressed it in both circumstances. We've now published some rules. We look for the forward to the public comment on it, on both of these. But these valuation transparencies will help lower risk, but it will also help people price their other products. Because if you can see where the clearinghouses is pricing, or if you're a counterparty, if you have an ex existing trade and you can see where your existing trade is being priced, uh, then you have the benefit as you consider your uh, ongoing risk. Furthermore, when the swap dealers um, uh, uh, or, or thinking about the marketplace, there's some other things uh, that they have information on that currently you all don't have. And I will call that aggregate information, aggregate information about the marketplace. So what Dodd-Frank actually said is there's a number of additional things uh, they, they want. Um, they've required that the trading venues themselves and the clearinghouses will provide aggregate information to the market. This aggregate information on a daily basis how many transactions actually occurred on a daily basis? What are the open interest? So in addition to pricing, it's also volume. Volume of transaction, volume of open interest. Also, interestingly, it requires the CFTC once every six months to do a report on the swaps marketplace. Now, I think we might have done this even if Congress didn't ask us. We have a long tradition every Friday putting out aggregate large trader data on the futures marketplace. Uh, it is, is my hope and goal that we can work towards that over a number of years. So Congress is asked to do us once every six months, but we have a long tradition at the CFTC of bringing transparency on a weekly basis to the futures marketplace. And I would hope, with the help of Congress and funding, that we could do that as well over a number of years in the swaps marketplace. The other part uh, of, of my discussion today is I want to talk a little bit about uh, access and competition. Transparency itself helps a marketplace and increases competition in the marketplace, but it's not enough on its own. Another key thing that Congress addressed was access to the marketplace. And without access to a marketplace, uh, you can't really have an open uh, uh, and competitive marketplace. Um, competition is essential to a well functioning market. In passing Dodd-Frank, Congress decided that there should be open access to swaps markets in a number of key ways. I'm going to talk about three of those, but it's not all they did. Um, first, in establishing these uh, swap execution facilities, the trading facilities itself, Congress required that the trading platform give multiple market participants the ability to execute an order with multiple participants, what some in the industry have called the many-to-many -many requirement. I had one uh, press availability when somebody said, if one person could make a bid to one other person, would that meet the many-to-many -many requirement? I smiled and I said, I didn't think so. I think Congress really wanted it more, more broadly. We've, of course, published a proposed rule. We look forward to comments on that proposed rule um, uh, to bring meaning to those words multiple participants being able to meet in a marketplace and have the ability to execute with multiple participants. The Congress didn't leave it to, at that. Also, they added language that said um, that the trading facilities have to give impartial access uh, to market participants. And so what that means, and we've put out a, a proposed rule on that, is that Anybody in the marketplace that is, uh, meets the fitness standards in the marketplace, um, you know, they don't have any problems with the law and things like that, 
and that they're uh, eligible contract participant, which means they have to have a certain net worth, it's not the retail public, can be uh, go to a trading facility and have access. The same way you have access to a futures marketplace and have access to the securities marketplace. You can have access to these marketplaces. You could leave a firm executable bid and the whole marketplace could see it. Any bank now could actually decide they want to risk their capital and, and make markets. A second area Congress ad addressed access was clearinghouses. Uh, clearinghouses have existed since the 1890s and they help lower risk to the marketplaces. They stand between a buyer and a seller and take the risk that one or the other defaults. Uh, but what's also important is, is the clearinghouses are open uh, again. It's an important central feature of a marketplace, and Congress addressed it by saying that, um, uh, that um, uh, all parties should have open access to a clearinghouse. Now, we, we address this through a proposed rule on clearinghouse participant eligibility that we put out in December and it was to promote fair and open access to the clearinghouses. Um, in the futures marketplace, that's been a key feature for many decades. Um, in the voluntary swap clearinghouses, they have not been mandated. Those have been more exclusive. They've been uh, l more limited in terms of their participation. And I think Congress uh, was well aware of that, uh, included a provision for open access. We've brought uh, some uh, more detail to that in the proposal, and again, we look forward to comments on that proposal as well. But it's a really important feature to lower risk to the marketplace that there are more participants in the marketplace. What we said, more specifically, is you couldn't exclude somebody if their capital wasn't in the billions of dollars and so forth. Uh, you could scale them. A clearinghouse could say the smaller capital you have, the smaller participation. The larger capital could be larger participation. Uh, you could scale folks but not exclude them necessarily if they weren't, uh, you know, the seven-footers in the NBA. Uh, or, in fact, as in some uh, clearinghouses now say, you have to have a trillion-dollar swap book or something before you can get in. The third area that Congress addressed open access to provoke competition is with regard to competition amongst these trading platforms themselves. They said that a clearinghouse um, needed to have non-discriminatory open access to different trading venues. And more specifically, they said that a clearinghouse will have to accept equivalent swaps for clearing regardless of where the transaction was executed. This includes both swaps um, that are executed bilaterally and also swaps that are on an unaffiliated trading facility. What does that mean? That means in the swaps marketplace, it cannot be directed just to your affiliated or vertically integrated trading platform. Um, now, Congress decided to do this in the swaps marketplace. This is not going to be a feature brought to the futures marketplace, uh, but it will, I think, promote competition. So let me just uh, wrap it up. The American public benefits uh, when markets are transparent, open, and competitive. I think any economic study over decades has shown the great benefit to the economy uh, when it is, is is such. Um, but in the swaps marketplace that's only really three decades old, uh, we've not had that. It's been opaque. It's generally been concentrated among a small group of dealers. Um, and uh, with this in mind and with the financial crisis, uh, Congress moved forward with this historic act, Dodd-Frank Act. Um, and I think it was the intent of Congress to to really bring diversity and sunshine to this marketplace. In effect, to democratize the marketplace, to make it much broader uh, and more open. Um, and it's our mission at the CFTC to fulfill Congress's mandate and to get this done. So I thank you, and I'm available to take questions. I think I'm going to have a press avail right afterwards, so I'll probably take questions from, from students, academics, and uh, uh, members of the uh, public who came to this uh, conference. And if you can be kind enough to tell me who you are when you stand up to ask a question, just so I know.
sorry. Uh, it, it seems like much of what you are talking about is to try to help the commercial users in the sense of more transparency, uh, better pricing, and everything. Yet the commercial users fought successfully to get exempted from much of this. Can you explain what's going on here? Sure. Um, I, I believe strongly that markets work best when they're transparent, open, and competitive. Um, and I think the economic research is clear on that. Um, but there is one feature in the, in the debate is to the benefit of lowering risk through clearing houses, um, which I didn't address directly in my remarks. But clearing houses, which have existed for about 120 years, um, lower risk by standing between buyers and sellers, but they also lower risk by saying that on a daily basis you have to post money called margin. It's for the lawyers in the room. It's like a performance bond that if you fail, if you default the next day, uh, the money is there. And that was the central feature that uh, the commercial end users uh, sought and uh, received from Congress uh, an, uh, an exception. It's called the end user exception. About 9 or 10 percent of the overall swaps marketplace measured in notional value is between swap dealers and these end users. 90 or 91% of the market is between dealers and dealers, dealers and insurance companies, dealers and in hedge funds, and so forth. So Congress said for that 90% or so, that has to come to the clearinghouse. Uh, for the other 9 or so percent, it doesn't have to come to the clearinghouses. In my own discussions with end users, they like transparency. They very much like transparency, and, and there was not a debate there. Uh, it, was, it was around the clearinghouse and the posting of margin, and I think that was, a, that was really a matter of uh, cost benefit, and, and, and Congress, I think, made a uh, thoughtful uh, outcome on that. Does that help? Um, and thank you for coming to speak to us. I'm Andrea Pesoros, and I'm a bank analyst from New York, and I actually reviewed sarbanes Oxley and I liked the legislation. Well, thank you. I'm going to actually have lunch with uh, Senator Sarbanes today, so I'll let him know that. Oh, good. I actually have family in Baltimore, so um, that's kind of interesting. Um, well, where are the banks going to get the money for margin and, and for um, to have the capital to be able to go into this? Because they have to pony up money, and, and they really, number one, are already adequately capitalized. And what do you think if, um, because analysts like me think that if you think about the externalities of um, where I think uh, the... Um, over-the-counter derivatives contracting is agency self-dealing, and that if they were cease and desisted, um, the externalities of not being able to write the over-the-counter derivatives contracting to the um, proliferation that they have and all the fair value gains that um, aren't like a, a like interest from a loan, you know, so they don't have operating cash flow from these from the fair value gains of these instruments. They need QE2 for liquid markets so that they can shadow a moving market. Right, so that they don't have a, cor a balance sheet that's shadowing correcting markets. So, if you think about the externalities of the costs of, up to society of this, versus forcing them to cease and desist, or society where we don't have this, you know, agency abuse of them contracting like this. So, do you think about these things at the CFTC, and and where would be we be now if if they were forced to cease and desist? What I think is agency self-dealing and covering for bad management decisions. Hmm. Can I address the first question? <laughs> and, and by the way, on the second one, I leave QE2 to the Federal Reserve. So, But um, uh, banks, one of the central features of Dodd-Frank is that the dealers themselves need to have comprehensive regulation for this activity. Um, I think it was one of the uh, uh, assumptions uh, in the past uh, that they not be regulated because they were regulated already. Um, but we certainly found in a, in, a, in a significant way in the AIG circumstance that it was such ineffective regulation. Even though AIG actually was regulated, it was such ineffective regulation. We needed explicit direct regulation on this activity called swaps and derivatives activity. So the banks and the non-banks for the first time will have to have explicit capital uh, for this activity. Now, the 
banking regulators, the Federal Reserve and others will do that for the banks, and the SEC and the CFTC will do it for the non-banks, the setting of the capital. But to your question, I think it's, it's uh, far less costly to the American public that the banks have the capital, have the cushion there for that activity, and that that's important. All right, so let, let me try to uh, summarize, and then I'll, I'll answer you, and then take an, another question from another. Um, so, <laughs> so derivatives that can last for many years have both a market risk and a credit risk, uh, market risk that interest rates move up and down. And I think Andrea is asking about, well, there's this credit risk, because uh, if, if somebody's not putting, uh, let me, uh, it's my answer. All right. So. Um, uh, and so one of the things Dodd-Frank has said is that the standard contracts, and well more than half of the marketplace is standard, should move to these central clearinghouses. And in the central clearinghouses, you have to post margin, the, the, the big banks, not, not the commercial end users, but the big banks will have to post margin on a daily basis to the clearinghouses. So that's the big bulk of the marketplace. There will still be a part of the marketplace that's customized or bilateral. And on the customized and bilateral, the bank regulators, the SEC and CFTC have been directed by Congress to also propose rules on posting of margin for the bilaterals. We've not yet done that. That's one of the, you know, the challenges. We've, we've published, I think, now 35 uh, proposed rules at the CFTC. The SEC has done their uh, list as well. Um, and I hope in the next month or so that we we're able to propose capital margin rules. But I think it directly relates to your question that a swap dealer entering into transaction with another swap dealer, a swap dealer with financial entities, um, that they, they post margin. Again, in this circumstance, I think this is, it's not a risk uh, of the same magnitude or same order between the swap dealers and the commercial end users. But the financial system itself is so intertwined, and I think you're correct. It generally is not cash flow um, uh, running on this, on the interest. And so one of the ways to protect the system that Congress did address is that we publish rules on the posting of margin between the dealers and the collecting of margin between the dealers and the financial system uh, to help lower risk. So uh, behind you, and then I'll go forward. Uh, Bert Ely, uh, thank you very hey, much. Bert. For I haven't seen you in years. Good to see you. Uh, um, I have just as much hair as uh, you last uh, saw me in the same for you, too. Um, yeah, yeah. Less hair, <laughs> more gray. Right. Um, but my question uh, relates more directly to the clearinghouses. What concern do you have about uh, whether or not a clearinghouse might fail uh, or, in effect, go bust? Uh, what protections are in place uh, in that regard? And should we view the, uh, the large clearing houses as essentially being too big to fail institutions? I think that uh, we have to be very vigilant and, and robust in the regulation of clearing houses. Um, uh, the uh, clearing houses uh, do take on risk uh, by centralizing all these transactions, and they have since the 1890s. But there's such a far better alternative than leaving these risk in the banks. And let me just mention a couple of reasons why. They're not in any other business. They're not in underwriting. They're not in proprietary trading. They're not in, in, in lending. Um, now, and, and in this case, there's not a benefit of diversification. I would belie anybody to say it would be better to leave this in the banks. Uh, secondly, they have to mark to market and value the transactions every single day and collect this margin, both initial margin at the beginning, but variation margin. 
They have to have guarantee funds and default mechanisms. And if somebody doesn't post the margin on the next day, they close out the transactions. Since the 1890s, banks fail every three to five years. As sure as we had a crisis in 2008, um, as terrible as it was, it was the worst in 80 years, we also had every three to five years some banks failing in between. And we will have more banks failing in the future. This is the nature of the financial markets. We can't repeal that. Clearing houses have failed very less often. In the U.S., we've survived them through two world wars, the Great Depression, and the financial crisis of 2008. So to me, I think they're just the, a better alternative, but they're not without risk. I agree with that, and they, they really do need robust regulation. But we look forward to the comments on the rules that we put out. It's my mantra. Uh, if we didn't get it right, I look forward to Bert, your comments, too, on the series of rules we put out on clearing houses. I said I'd go up front here. Hey, Brian. Good. All right, good. Brian Kalish with AFP. Um, so going, kind of going back to the first question, end users, obviously we've had some good discussions about that and we stand on one side. I just wanted to address, and it was actually in the press yesterday, the fact that financial institutions, those that weren't exempt uh, from the end user, uh, are now beginning to lobby uh, CFTC uh, specifically about how they might be included in that. And I just wanted to get your comments on that. Since it was, I well, I, I, I didn't read the particular article that you're, to which you're referring, but I think that Congress uh, uh, addressed this issue and, and addressed it looking at uh, a, a number of things. Uh, one is approximately 90 percent of the marketplace, we don't have terrific statistics, but approximately 90 percent is between financial entity and financial entity, and about 9 or 10 percent is not. Um, secondly, what is the risk within the financial system. And financial companies uh, and financial companies at, at large, it's not just one or two banks, rely on the confidence of markets. And in crisis, there are runs. In that great 1946 move, movie, It's a Wonderful Life, we think of George Bailey and the George Bailey Savings and Loans. Everybody know the movie? Yeah, yeah, okay, even the students? No, all right, good, 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 all right, so. But, uh, you know, and George is there, and, and he's got the run on the savings and loan, and he takes the honeymoon money, and you, you, you know the whole story. Um, well, the modern run on the bank is the run on the shadow banking system. It's not banks. It was uh, mutual f funds, money market mutual funds. It, it was uh, something called prime brokerage between the hedge funds and the banks, and the investment banks. So our financial system is so intertwined. And in AIG, the first $90 billion that went into AIG, we've all read about it, about $60 billion went through AIG to other banks. It's the interconnectedness of this financial system. It's why I feel uh, I was an advocate for, but I think Congress got this very right, that we need to have the financial actors, not just the banks, but also the hedge funds, insurance companies, and so forth, in uh, these clearing houses for their standard transactions to lower risk. Because in 2020 or 2030 or whenever it comes and a secretary of the treasury then has to decide, uh, uh, um, do we, do we shut down a bank? Do we put it into receivership? You want to give them the greatest latitude that some assistant secretary doesn't walk in and say, uh, sir, or, 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 or hopefully by then we have a woman secretary of the treasury, and, uh, and, uh, and say, you know, if you uh, shut this one down, the whole insurance sector might fail, or the whole community banking sector or something, because it's so intertwined. Um, uh, so I think, I mean, I think Congress addressed this and I think for a logical set of reasons kept the financial actors in the clearing. But uh, all the way in the back. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Parisa Mantegui. I'm a second year uh, law student over at GW. Great. I have a little bit of an administrative question for you. Sure. Um, after 9-11, we saw one of the criticisms of the executive being that we had 19 intelligence agencies and it was unclear who was talking with whom, who was doing what, who was in charge of what responsibilities. Now with Dodd-Frank, to what extent do you think agency turf wars with 
the CFTC and the SEC and you have the Fed and the Federal Trade Commission and the FDIC and the new Consumer Protection Agency. To what extent do you think uh, there may be gaps in terms of uh, uh, enforcement of Dodd-Frank moving forward? And, you know, at least in the intelligence community, it's 10 years later and they're still dealing with these same types of problems. So what are you doing as the head of, of this agency to at least minimize problems that might arise from? Uh, it's a great question. Situation. It's a challenge of government around the world um, uh, and, and, and of financial regulation specifically. Um, uh, the CFTC is a small agency. We're only about 680 people, and we only this past year got back to our, our weight of 1999. We were actually shrunk down to the 430 weight uh, uh, during the prior administration. I mentioned that not to advocate for budget, which I'll always advocate for budget and resources because we are sorely in need of that. But I mention it because we have a, a large and, and long tradition of leveraging off of others. <laughs> so internationally, we enter into a bunch of mutual uh, recognition agreements and uh, memorandums of understanding with international regulators. Here domestically, our, our closest working relationship was with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And it's not to say that we don't have differences. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I'm on the phone with uh, Mary Shapiro and, and, and uh, we have, have differences. But what we do together uh, is far more than what we do in our differences. And so what we've done, uh, and just take the SEC, is uh, we set up a joint advisory committee. We actually had to get an act of Congress to allow us to spend money on a joint advisory committee, but we did that. Um, uh, on our rule writing, we're sharing. In this rule writing, we shared all of our internal term sheets and recommendation memos, some of them 50 pages long, with all the other federal regulators. The Federal Reserve got it, the controller of the currency, and, and the SEC, and so forth. Um, and we've gotten terrific comments and help back from them. So I'd say uh, it's a matter of consult, 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 and as a chairman of an agency to tell people to leave as best they can to, to leave this their uh, turf at the door and just figure out what the law says and what's best for the public. But it's not, I mean, there are times that people kind of jostle around. The biggest gap was, uh, this market here. This market wasn't regulated in part because uh, it was like who was going to regulate it. It wasn't the only reason. I mean, there were a lot of other reasons. But in part, it was a big gap. And I think Congress addressed that and asked the Securities and Exchange Commission and the CFTC to do it. Um, uh, but I, uh, that's, uh, hopefully that answers your question. The, the Congress also set up a Financial Stability Oversight Council that I'm honored to be on. We meet for the third time next Tuesday, and it's, and, you know, that's a, a process of learning together. All eight of us who are there, and there'll be two more voting members, there's five non-voting members, are all learning different personalities and with the direction of the Secretary of the Treasury who's chair of it, and he's doing a great job at it, but we're all sort of learning how that, this new organization works together. Welcome back, and really want to thank you again for your at least second recent keynote uh, at GW. We really appreciate your support of that. I'd thank also you. like to, in, in, on, on the subject of support, I know that you're under a continuing resolution, but uh, we do offer a derivatives. You noticed. <laughs> <laughs> we do offer a derivatives class, the law school, financial regulatory reform class. I've seen some amazing derivatives papers, so when you have job openings, please uh, let us know. <laughs> uh, thank you. But uh, my, my, my question was a, a little easier one. Uh, I don't know if these glasses on the stage are sort of a metaphor for your feelings about the uh, legislation. Uh, the glass being most, <laughs> the glasses being mostly half full, or mostly full, more than half full. Uh, were there any areas where you thought that due to the legislative process, compromise, what have you, there, I, and I know you work very actively on legislation and you're, and you're to be commended for that, but were there any areas that you felt that the legislation could have maybe gone a little uh, further in terms of openness, transparency, competitiveness? 
Excellent question. I, I, I have to say that uh, I think that the, the resulting statute on those three areas, transparency, openness, and competitiveness, is excellent. Now, we could gum it up in our rules, <laughs> um, and there'll be a lot of pressures, a lot of pressures. Um, market actors uh, uh, don't all benefit from transparency. I think end users do, and certainly the economy at large does. There's great benefits, but not every individual market actor benefits from transparency. Um, so there'll be a lot of pressures back, but I think uh, particularly on transparency, look, there's real-time reporting for every transaction, there's pre-trade transparency for the non-block standardized transactions, and there's this aggregate long-term transparency um, that I talked about. I, I think Congress did very well in that regard. We could have gotten funding in there. <laughs> I'll say that, that would have been funding, funding, but that's not to your question. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. You're very kind to say that, but I. 